I will have such revenges on you that all the world shall know. I will do such things, what they are, yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. King Lear. Oft I have heard that grief softens the mind and makes it fearful and degenerate. Think, therefore, on revenge and cease to weep. Henry V. Revenge should have no bounds. Hamlet. I'll never pause again. I'll never stand still till either death hath closed these eyes of mine or fortune gives me measure of revenge. Henry V. The croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. Macbeth. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Are you well? Are you good? I am. Ah, okay, what a week. So, still recovering from last weekend's wrongful conviction episode and the midweek short stories episode. And what the fuck is that noise? Uh, um, Excuse me, I think someone's playing a fucking trumpet. Next, what the hell is this? Oh, okay, maybe not. It's gone away now. Yeah, so the midweek episode that had, um, oh yeah, the horrible, horrible suicide story. So thank you if you got in touch and thank you if you reached out because you felt affected by those stories. Okay, shout out. Hello to Mason Merrill, a new listener to the podcast, a new member to the Facebook group. Thanks for getting in touch, man. Matt Wilson. Thanks for your lovely email, Matt, just to say that you really like the podcast and your corrections on my grammar, which were useful to me. I find that those incredibly useful. I'm a severely dyslexic, so I may often miss grammatical things or I may write a sentence and think that it actually makes a lot of sense and it sometimes it just takes someone to point these things out if you do spot those things point them out to me it's really it's good it's good for me Deb Walters hello to you on Instagram Lauren Walters your birthday post was amazing as they all were but it really was it was great I loved the um, the cheeky cheeky post from Eslin George with the, the men's bums out with happy birthday written across them. That really made me laugh. Hannah Ellison, who mocked up a sketch of a T-shirt saying, I stand with Shouty Man, which I really liked. And lastly, Anna A. Walgren. I hope that's the right pronunciation for that, Anna. Anna A. Walgren. Yes. In fact, let me just... Well, okay. I wasn't sure how you say your surname, Anna. I tried this just before earlier on when I was testing my recording. So, if I've not said it right, it's it's not my fault. Blame, blame bloody Siri. That's who to blame. Hey, Siri. I'm here. How do I pronounce W-A-H-L... G R E N. Siri, come on. 
Siri, how do I pronounce W A H L G R E N? Walgren, Walgren. Hey Siri. Siri, how do I pronounce the surname W A H L G R E N? Okay, I found this on the web for how do I pronounce the surname W E H L G R N. Take a look. Siri, you you brought me up fucking Walkman. I know how you say Walkman. It's not that's not the name I'm trying to spell. W A H L G R E N. Oh, you're a piece of fucking nonsense. Ah, oh, I'm not trying to pronounce Nguyen. Oh, right. Anyway, give up, Anna. Anna. I'm just gonna call you Anna. Okay. Hi. Hello. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Thanks for getting in touch. Okay. Let's talk revenge. A dish best served cold goes the old cliché. I think about revenge, I suppose the term that really jumps into my head right now is revenge porn. There's so many stories of it everywhere. People using things that they've um, done with their partners against each other when it comes to a breakup. Of course, so many of the true crime stories that I tell you or that you know or that actually the world knows are all based around revenge. In psychological terms, it's described as the bruising of the ego and the need to soothe that bruise. It's an interesting one, revenge, isn't it? Because it is... We've all felt it. We all know we want revenge on someone, for something. And it's a kind of fire that bubbles up inside of you. And it's quite hard to, yeah, to make that subside. All right, let's get to the story. This is the story, Buford the Bull. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Okay, it's 1966 in Tennessee. A call comes into the sheriff's office from a young couple staying in a motel nearby. They tell the sheriff's office the following story. They're a young couple, they're on holiday and they've been involved in an incident. What's happened? asked the sheriff's office. And they stated that the motel owner, one Louise Hathcock, had taken their purse and wallet. And when they asked for it back, she had threatened them with a gun. I mean, not ideal if you're on holiday, is it? It's not ideal for the owner of the motel to steal your wallet, your purse, and then threaten you with a gun. So, so the sheriff's office, they spring into action And Buford Pusser, along with two deputies, go to the motel. Now before even going there, the police, and especially Sheriff Pusser, knows exactly what the motel owner, Louise Hathcock, was about. They knew her to be dangerous. They knew this because two years before this night she had shot and killed her husband in that very motel. Louise, she claimed that her husband had been beating her for years and that one night she'd got to a point where she just had had enough. Enough was enough. She took her pistol and she shot him. And when it came to a trial for Louise, she was found not guilty because the defence put forward such a good case about the beatings from her husband. So here is Sheriff Pusser and his deputies. They're travelling to her motel. 
Now I'm going to pause on this bit of the story and I'm going to introduce the characters that we need to know about as the story continues. Let's start with Sheriff Pusser. He's the main man of the story. Who was he? Well, he was a 26-year-old sheriff. He was the youngest sheriff ever to be elected in Tennessee. Now, why elect a guy so young to such a big job? I mean, they had they had guys in their 40s, in their 50s. They'd been doing this job for so long. Why? Why elect Buford Pusser? Well, because he had drive. He had a passion. He had a real burning deep desire to clean up the county. What he wanted to tackle was prostitution, illegal alcohol making, gambling, theft, and lots of the horrible attacks that were happening to people that were visiting the county. Buford Pusser had been born in Tennessee, raised in Tennessee, and he was proud of this place in the world. Before he um, went into the police, actually, he spent time as a wrestler. Yeah, he'd been a really great wrestler at high school, and he thought that that was going to be his career. So he went and he spent, I think he moved to somewhere like Chicago, and he spent a couple of years as a wrestler. But deciding that actually that's not how he wanted his life to go. He didn't really want his life to pan out that way. He moves back to Tennessee. And when he moves back, he meets and he marries a beautiful woman named Pauline at age 20. And she's a stunner. She's a real... The images of her are great. She's real 1970s glam. She's got like the big beehive and... Oh, she's just yeah, wearing all the all the clothes from that from that time. She just she's absolutely gorgeous. They would uh, go on to have a daughter. His nickname, and this kind of came from his wrestling days, was Buford the Bull. And as the story goes on, as I tell you about the next few years of his life, he really lives up to the name Buford the Bull. So, Sheriff, Buford the Bull, Pusser, he makes it his mission to get all of the illegal activity stopped. He would perform raids on bars and discover that they were illegally making whiskey and selling it. He would raid motels and he would find prostitution happening. He found drugs illegal firearms, it was all going on in this county. The mob really had a grip on this place and Sheriff Pusser was going to change that. Now, did this make him a popular man? Well, uh, did it fuck? Far from it. As you can imagine, he was hated. His office and his deputies, they loved him. They thought this man was a hero. Because he was hell-bent on cracking down on this illegal activity. But this didn't suit the mob. The people who were creating all of this activity. So one of the people he was targeting is the woman I just mentioned. Louise Hathcock. Her motel was a den of sin and bad behaviour. Visitors would go to her motel... To just, just to stay, just to have a couple of nights. And they would find all of their money was taken. Their possessions were gone. And when they challenged it, she'd just pull out a gun. Sometimes people would leave her motel with black eyes because they had dared to challenge the fact that someone had come into the room and taken all of their stuff. <sighs> so another member of the mob we need to know about is Mr... White. Mr. White was the man making the illegal whiskey and he was selling it in his bar stroke club. And again, if you were an out of town visitor and you happened to just visit, 
Mr. White's Bar Stroke Club. You'd be taken into a bathroom, you'd be robbed, you'd be beaten, and then you'd be kicked out. So, I mean, seriously, this is not an ideal holiday destination, this county. It's just terrible what's going on. There's two other men in the story whose name I'll give you now, but I'll talk about later. Mr. French and a man called Nix. So for the sake of clarity, let's remember, we have Louise, we have Mr. White, we have Mr. French, and we have Nix. The four mobsters creating all of the illegal activity. They were known as the State Line Bunch. The mob, they absolutely hated Sheriff Pusser because they he had forced them to move their moonshine business out of the county. So moonshine, if you well, you will know, but if you don't know, moonshine's the process of making illegal alcohol and selling it. So it's not going through any sort of proper channels. You're just basically making it in your back door and then selling it and making a huge profit out of it. So he had made all of that move somewhere else. He had gotten rid of that, taken it out of the town. Moonshine, when I think of it, it just makes me think of those two, who are those two Simpsons, uh, two, yeah, two Simpsons characters. Do you know the ones that they, they make their own moonshine? They're supposed to be the kind of like trailer, trailer trash type. I don't know what I'm even talking about. So now we know Pusser has a deep involvement with the state line bunch this gang of four so they're on their way to the motel responding to the call so they arrive and the first thing they do is they try to find the young couple who placed the call and they can't find them they cannot locate them in that motel odd so Pusser says to his deputies, you go and search the motel for them. I will go and find Louise Hathcock. Now, at this point, I'm going to stop saying her surname, right? Because I'm hearing it in my own head. And it's sounding like I'm saying Louise Hathcock. Louise Hascock. That's that's what it's sounding like when I say it. I'm just gonna it's kind of killing the mood of the story for me. I'm trying to create a bit of drama here and all I can hear is Louise Hascock in my head. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna call her Louise. Just for just for sake of sake of smoothness. Okay? So Pusser is looking around. He's trying to find Louise and he locates her and she's in her little office in the motel. She's drunk, very drunk. She has a large vodka and tonic in her hand. She says to him, let's talk in private. I think this is slightly odd practice, but he agrees and they go into Louise's bedroom. When inside the bedroom, she produces a gun. This is the same gun that she used to kill her husband two years earlier. And she says to Sheriff Pusser, I'm going to kill you. And she fires the gun. However, she misses him and the shot goes through the window. She goes to fire a second shot and the gun misfires. Sheriff Pusser takes his gun out and he shoots her three times. He doesn't miss. He doesn't misfire. Three shots go directly into Louise. In her last moments, she tries to crawl to the bathroom and this is where she dies. Immediately, the two deputies burst into the room. They find Sheriff Pusser standing in the bedroom and Louise dead in the bathroom. 
Now, the next thing to happen is that a team of medical examiners arrive and the motel is shut down as a crime scene. News starts to spread really quickly around the county and around the whole of Tennessee about the death of Louise and lots of conflicting stories begin to emerge. Pusser will always say he shot her in self-defence. But there's a little bit of doubt over that. The inquiry, right, it throws up this potential evidence that his gun might have been the first gun to be shot in that situation. You know, it's all that, um, I don't know the term for it, but you know when, like, it's, I find it so fantastically, fantastically interesting. It's when you can look at a bullet and determine what angle it was shot from, what speed it was shot at, all those, you you, you know, like, they, they look at it and they go, well, if it went that direction, it means that it was probably here. So this is what they try and examine at this point, is actually who in that room that night fired the shots first. Did she go to shoot him, hit the window, and then misfire before he shot her? Or did actually he shoot the first bullet and hers was self-defence? So it's muddy. It's really muddy and it's really unclear. What is quite interesting is that actually it stands up as self-defence. If he shot her when she said the words, I'm going to kill you, that's enough for self-defence. There's intention, intent. If he believed in that moment that she was actually going to do it, him shooting her three times is actually enough for self-defence. Hmm. Anyway, there's no real way to ever prove what happened in that bedroom and really Sheriff Pusser is the only one who can ever say what happened in there. A grand jury clear Sheriff Pusser of any wrongful doing in the death of Louise. He returns to being Sheriff and it's business as usual. Well, maybe not. Not for the mob, it's not. Not for the gang of four that she was part of. They've just lost one of their key players. Louise was helping them with the motel to store alcohol. She was smuggling money for people. She was big in the game and now she was dead. Seven months after the motel incident, Sheriff Pusser is one evening driving home to his beautiful wife Pauline. She's at home waiting for him to come back. And as he's driving, a car pulls up really close beside him and he starts to think, what's happening here? Is someone in trouble? Is someone trying to get his attention? So he winds down the window and as he does, the other car also winds down its window and two shots are fired at the sheriff from the other car. He takes one bullet in his shoulder and the other in his chest. Who was driving the other car? Well, it was Mr. French who you remember I mentioned earlier. He is a part of this four. He is a part of this mob. Who is the shooter? Well, it's Mr. White, who you remember is the one making the illegal alcohol. So, once they've shot the sheriff, they speed off. Now, unbelievably, Buford the Bull, he manages with two shots in him to drive himself to the hospital. And despite these shots, he's out of hospital in a few days 
and back to his sheriff duties. Now he knows exactly who did this. So the search for Mr White and Mr French begins. A few months pass and neither man has been caught. And then out of nowhere, Mr White walks in to a police station and he confesses. He says, yeah, I was the man that night who shot at Sheriff Pusser. He's charged and he's sent to prison. Mr French is still at large. He hasn't been caught at this point and he hasn't come forward. So, what are we dealing with here? Well, revenge. The three remaining mobsters, they want revenge on the sheriff for the death of Louise. I will have such revenges on you that all the world shall know. I will do such things. What they are, yet I know not. But they shall be the terrors of the earth. King Lear. So to go back to the four. Louise, dead. Mr White, in prison. Mr French, still on the run. And that fourth member, who I haven't introduced yet, Nix, is about to come into the story in a big, big way. From inside prison, Mr White makes a phone call to Nix and he says, I want you to find Sheriff Pusser and kill him. And Nix says, okay, I agree. He has to be killed. So, soon after, one casual Tuesday evening, the sheriff is at home with his wife Pauline. Their then five-year-old daughter is staying over with a friend. And a call comes into the home. There's a bit of trouble happening somewhere in the county and Sheriff Pusser he thinks well it'll just be another domestic abuse situation he gets these all the time so he thinks this is this is what it'll be it'll be a routine go to this domestic abuse case there'll be a husband and a wife arguing and I'll split it up and I'll sort it out so Pauline, his wife, she doesn't really want to be left at home on her own on this evening. So she says, well, if it's just a routine job, I'll come along with you. That's fine. So so he gets his things and they head out. They're in the car and they're driving towards the road where the problem is. And as they're driving, a car pulls up beside them. Now, we've been here before. It didn't go well the last time, and this time it's going to be so much worse. In the car that pulls up next to them was Nix. The man that Mr White had called from prison. And now, a terrible attack is going to happen on Sheriff Pusser and his wife. The car pulls up to the passenger side and shots are fired. And of course, Nix had no idea that Pauline, the sheriff's wife, was going to be in the car and devastatingly she takes the most of the bullets. She's shot eight times and she dies immediately. Sheriff Pusser drives at high speed 
for three miles to get away from this car and then he stops. What a fucking horrible three miles that must have been. He stops the car. He tries to revive wife Pauline, but she's been shot so many times, there's absolutely no chance of survival. He gets out of the car and he sees no sign of Nick's having followed him. But he's wrong. A moment later, the car appears and Nix opens fire on Sheriff Pusser. One of the shots hits him in the jaw and it blows away a part of his face. Another hits him in the leg and in this moment, what he does is he decides to play dead. He falls down and he lays motionless. And he waits. And he waits. Convinced that he must be dead, Nix flees the scene. Happy, believing that he has killed the sheriff. Once Nix is gone for a few minutes, Sheriff Pusser gets up and he tries to use the police radio in his car to ask for help. The call goes through, but no one can understand what he's trying to say. After his third call to them, they realise something is really wrong. Help is sent. Police arrive at the scene. They find Pauline dead and the sheriff is taken straight away to the hospital. Horrible. But he's Buford the Bull. This man is incredible at surviving all sorts of attacks. Oh, this one, however, this hits him, of course, the hardest. He's lost his wife and his life will be forever changed. He's in hospital for 25 days and he has eight major surgeries in that time to try and restore his face and fix the damage to his legs. This is horrible but actually he was in such a bad place that during his time in hospital he missed the funeral of his wife. He just couldn't. He just wasn't able to leave a hospital bed. But the funeral had to go ahead and he missed it. Eventually he gets out of hospital. What do you think's on his mind at this point? Revenge. Oft I have heard that grief softens the mind and it makes it fearful and degenerate. Think, therefore, on revenge and cease to weep. Henry V. When he's finally in a place where he can talk about the incident, police around him, they want to know who was the man who shot at you that night. And he knows... He knows who this man was. He knows it was Nix. But he never says his name. Why? Because he wanted to take care of this himself. Ah, Buford the Bull. Now, I'm not sure at this point that it's the right thing to do, to take it into your own hands. And I sort of paused here and I thought, I was like, is it the right thing to take it into your own hands? No, it's not. But also, 
I suppose any reasoning goes out your head at that point. I suppose you're not even really reasoning anything. Whether you work <laughs> as a sheriff, whether law has been your life or not, at the moment when your wife has been brutally murdered in front of you, your face has been blown apart. That revenge that you want, that you're desperately seeking, maybe you do think, I'll just take this into my own hands and deal with it my way. When he's questioned further and further, all that he will say is, I know that Mr. White ordered this, and I know that it was Nix who fired those shots. So a year passes, and a tough, tough year for the sheriff. So, what happens to the three men that the sheriff wants revenge upon? One by one, they will all end up sorry that they ever missed with Sheriff Pusser. So Mr. White, his his dead body turns up in his car in the car park of a motel and he's been shot in the head. There are so, so many versions of how this shot happened, how he might have died, but the most probable is that someone was hiding in the back seat of his car and shot him at close range. Who? Well, we'll never know. But Sheriff Pusser's name is certainly brought into the frame. But, and this might be just a little too convenient the death of Mr. White isn't looked into too closely by police. Hmm. Interesting. Nix, the shooter of Pauline and the man responsible for her death, he's found and he's charged with a completely unrelated murder. A completely unrelated murder that happened somewhere else in Tennessee that he actually, I really don't think, had anything to do with. So many people will say he did not commit that crime. Yes, he committed the crime where he killed Pauline that night. But actually, he was charged for a murder that I don't think he was actually involved in. But he was sentenced to life in prison in solitary confinement. And lastly, Mr. French. His body is discovered drowned in a creek in Mississippi. And now that's all three of the state line bunch dead. And the one who fired the shots at his wife is in solitary confinement for life. Buford the Bull is never found to have any connection to these events. But what has happened is that the 26 year old sheriff who set out to eradicate those four people it's happened they're all gone Pusser's story is now huge news and there is a film made uh, based loosely on the events in his life and on parts of the story I've never heard of it it's called Walking Tall it's a cult classic I believe or so the internet tells me. <laughs> and the sheriff, well, he's coming back one day. 
from a meeting with the film studio about a possible sequel to the film. So he's driving home when the steering in his car starts to fail. He tries to get the car off the road, but before he can, his car skids. He hits an embankment and he flies through the windscreen, breaking his neck and dying instantly. He was 36 years old. Was the car tampered with? Had someone ordered the death once more of Sheriff Pusser? Were there other members of the mob outside of those four hell-bent on revenge? I find myself asking, is this the ultimate story of a revenge cycle gone horribly wrong? I think it might be. And so ends the story of Buford the Bull. I will have such revenges on you that all the world shall know. I will do such things. What they are, yet I know not. But they shall be the terrors of the earth. King Lear. Okay, well, revenge. It is a bastard. Watch out for it. <laughs> There's a museum actually built in honour to uh, Buford the Bull. And if you go to that part of Tennessee, you can also visit um, the Sheriff's Grave and Pauline's Grave, if that's your thing. I'm not sure if it is, but if that's your thing, fine. Go and, go and visit. Okay, well... All that remains, really, is for me to say thanks for listening. Thanks for getting in touch the way that you do. Your stories, your pictures, your messages, your emails, they're all wonderful to receive. Just don't stop, don't stop. I'm going to bring this one weird thing up. Um, it's, it's a bit odd. Yeah. <sighs> What's the best way to talk about this? Um, well, basically, I received a voicemail on my phone from someone who listens to the podcast. And it was a very nice voicemail. It was lovely. It was just like, hey, Barry, I just want to say, really enjoy the podcast, really into it. Here's a story you might be interested in. Anyway, thanks, man. Love the stories, blah, 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 blah. So that's lovely, that's fine, but it just, it freaked me out slightly that it was on my personal phone, <laughs> that it was on my actual, <laughs> on my actual phone. And it, it, that's kind of my fault slightly because I don't think my security settings are particularly brilliant, so you probably could track down my number if you wanted to, and obviously someone has felt that that's what they wanted to do, they very much wanted to track me down and leave me a voicemail. There's so many other ways that you can get in contact with me. And if you do or you have ever gotten in contact with me, you'll know I'm in the Facebook group all the time. I'm always looking at Twitter. I'm always looking at Instagram. If you send me an email, any of those things, I will reply. I will always, and I don't, and it's not generic replying. It's not kind of like, oh, thank you. Do you know what I mean? I'm not being shit about it. I'm actually being like, I genuinely care if you get in touch with me. I just had a moment where I was like, oh, getting in touch with me. Having my phone number may be a bit odd. Maybe I'm not delighted by that. Because you can access me and the podcast and the group and, and whatever at any time. You, you don't need to just come directly to my phone. But um, as I say, it wasn't a horrible message. It was actually quite a nice message. And it's not someone that I can actually... Unfortunately, this person... I. I search and search but they're not a part of the Facebook group don't follow me on Twitter and don't follow me on Instagram so I can't actually 
other than returning the call, which is what I, I don't want to go down that road. Um, other than returning the call, I can't really do it much more. Um, yeah. So anyway. I've mentioned them all there, but if you want to get me Twitter, Instagram, Facebook group, get in touch. Please get in touch. I always want to hear from you. I always want to hear what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what's going on. Okay? If you know a great story, if you know an extraordinary story, get in touch. Okay? Goodbye. It didn't affect me really one way or the other. (laughs) I would imagine from the look on his face, let's get it on, let's do it, let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.